Amen. Come on, give the Lord one more shout. Hallelujah. Well, you could be seated. Um, if you were here last week, you know that Bishop, Apostle Tom, and I kind of did a little tag team. We actually, all three of us, stayed pretty much within our time. How many believe that there are miracles that still happen? Okay. Um, and Bishop said last week that this was going to be a year of double for your trouble. A year of restoration, a year of recovery. And he talked to us out of Job, which I know Job isn't the, 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 the nicest uh, book that uh, you can read sometimes because you see all the things that happened to him. But at the very end, you got to go to the last chapter, at the very end, Job got back twice what he lost. He got double for his trouble. Amen. How many believe that we're going to step into 2024 with victory, with an overcoming heart, an overcoming mind? Listen, um, I saw a post that said this. It said, Lord, I pray this year you give me a fat bank account and a skinny body. Please don't get it mixed up like you did last year. Okay. All right. So we're going into this year with victory. All right. And then Apostle Tom's going to be preaching next week about um, leaping into the more in 2024. And then last, na last week, I discussed some of the biblical significance of the number 24. I'm going to do this real quickly um, just to kind of update you a little bit. But when you study in the, in the Word of God, you find out that the, that the number 24 has a connotation of God's government. 12 is a governmental number, and God's government that you find in the throne room of heaven, there are 24 thrones with 24 elders sitting on the throne. That is a heavenly council. And so I believe in this year that that governmental anointing for increased authority and unshakable faith is coming upon us. Come on, how many believe that God wants to increase our authority? God wants to make our faith unshakable. He wants to put us into new positions, new promotions to lead. Um, he wants to bring that clash of kingdoms. Listen, there is a clash, if you're not aware, between the woke and the awakened. And you're going to have to decide, are you going to be part of the woke or are you going to be part of the awakened? Last week, I think I, I shared with you that in 2020, the Lord gave me a word that kind of set the course for, I believe, the decade. And we were in a morning, in morning prayer, and the Lord said this to me. Number one, he said, I need you to tell the people that they're coming into a time when chaos will increase. How many think I'm a true prophet? How many think it's been crazy since 2020? Coming into a time when chaos will increase. But then he said, but wait. He said, but then I want you to tell them that I am going to use chaos to strip the covering off of the corruption and the evil things that have been being done in secret, the wrong ideologies, the wrong mindsets, the wrong agendas that are being pressed. And the Lord says, I'm going to use chaos to expose it. Listen, I think we saw some of that this week when the president of Harvard and the presidents of those other universities, did, did y'all watch that a couple of weeks ago when they were brought before com Congress and they couldn't even condemn calls for genocide of the, uh, of the Israeli people? They, couldn't, they wouldn't condemn it. They said, oh, it's, it depends on the context. No, there's no context to calls for genocide. Okay, but see, that's one of the examples of God bringing to exposure things that are being done so that he can overthrow them. Amen. And this last week, the president of Harvard, as well as I think the president, I think of Penn, ended up having to resign because of those positions. Can we thank the Lord that he always carries out his word? Amen. So we need to be watching for God's ways of using chaos to uncover the works of darkness. So the Lord said, I'm going to, there's going to be more chaos. I'm going to use chaos. And then the third thing he said to me was, and then tell the people, the God of peace is rising. The God of peace is rising. He said it three times, the God of peace is rising. And this, of course, comes from Romans 16, 20, when it declares, and the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Some of you need to put him under your feet this morning, amen? And so I believe that this is going to be a year of increased authority and unshakable faith. It's also going to be a year of divine 
order. God is setting things in order. I really can't take time to preach these, but there are places in the scripture where God divides the priests, the worshipers, and the gatekeepers into 24 divisions. And then, of course, number three is it's the fullness of time. There's 24 hours in a day, a season of completion and fulfillment. I talked about how the two main words for time in scripture are the words chronos and kairos. These are the two Greek words. Chronos means the normal passage of time, day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year. That's the normal passage of time. We all live in chronos. But if you are not, and kairos is that appointed time. It's the time when the heavens open. Kairos is that time when God comes down and visits us. He encounters us. He breaks through for us. He fights for us. But listen, if you've not been faithful in the chronos, you're not going to get to your kairos. And that's why I believe messages like this are, are geared towards resetting us, resetting our heart, resetting our affection, resetting our focus so that we come into a new season with new faith and with new expectation. And then, of course, finally, we talked about that it was a year of doors. This is the year um, 2024, or on the Hebraic calendar, 5784. The four in Hebrew is a, um, it's, it's a letter, and it's, a, it's the letter Dalet, and it is the picture of an open door. How many are believing that God is opening doors this year for all of us? Amen. Opportunities and uh, different things that he's doing for us. In Hebrew, 24 is the words kaf dalet. Kaf dalet. Kaf means the palm of your hand. And dalet means door. So when I hear that, I hear that there are doors we're going to have to push. Okay, so I think there's three different kinds of doors we're going to encounter this year. There's doors we're going to have to push. Here we hear God say, oh, it's a year of open doors. And we just go, yes, Lord, bring it on. But guess what? Sometimes we got to push to open a door. That's one kind of door. The second kind of door is going to be a motion-activated door. Have you ever been walking into a store and as you're walking, you know it's an activa a motion-activated door, it automatically opens. Listen, there are going to be some doors this year that are not going to open until you move. Some of you are standing there waiting for the door to open and God says, it's not going to open until you move. You got to take steps of faith. You've got to do prophetic acts. You got to get moving. How many know it's very difficult to steer a bicycle that's standing still? Just think about that for a minute. Okay, so God's saying the second kind of door is doors that you're going to have to be motion activated and you're going to have to walk through them as, as they're opening. The third kind is the Hebraic year, 5784, the year of pay dalet. Pay is the 80, but a, pay also means mouth, voice, and sound. So these doors this year, I believe, are also going to be voice activated doors. Amen? Voice, we're going to speak to things, and we're going to begin to see them open. We're going to sing to things, and we're going to sing them, see them open. We're going we're gonna to shout in, into the atmosphere, and then we'll see them open. I told you all about our conversation with Surrey. Voice activation, right? My husband, we were driving down the road one day, and, and he said, Surrey, uh, give me the directions to su such and such. And Surrey said to him, Surrey is in the iPhone, for those of you that don't, aren't aware, Suri said to him, um, I'm sorry, Tom, I don't understand what you're saying. So he said, again, Suri, give me directions to such and such. And she said, I'm sorry, Tom, I still don't understand what you're saying. And he said, well, Suri, what good are you then? And Suri answered him and said, now, Tom, don't have an attitude. <laughs> he looked at me and he said, did you program my phone to say that? <laughs> But how many understand that the spirit realm is listening? And there are things that are voice activated. It's also the time of the double doors. You're going to hear us say that a lot. Isaiah 45 verse 1 speaks about the opening of the double doors. We went to dinner with our friend Rabbi Kurt Landry this last week, and we were sharing that with him. And he said the next morning, he very, very early, the Lord awakened him, and he had an encounter with the Lord and said, tell the people that the doors are open already. 
They're not opening, they are open. But you've got to do acts of faith in order to access those doors that are open. And he said it was like in John chapter 21, when Jesus had been resurrected from the dead and his disciples went out fishing and they were fishing all night and they came ashore and they had caught nothing. And Jesus was standing there on the shore and, and they were talking and Jesus said, I want you to go back out and cast your net on the other side. How many know at that moment they knew it was Jesus? And they went out and they cast their net. Listen, you may have been doing the same thing over and over and over. You may have been praying the same prayers. You may have been uh, confessing the same decrees. You may have been making the same uh, stands of faith. But there comes a time when God says, now is the time. And they've been fishing all night and got nothing for their work. But Jesus said, now at my word, cast your net on the other side. And so I believe that this is the season that we are going to see that and God is going to open to us the double doors. On Friday night, Bishop gave a word to Vision Church and it came out of Revelation chapter 3 when God's speaking to the church at Philadelphia. And you'll, you'll recognize this because he says this. He says, I have set an open door before you that no man can shut. Listen, it's not just to this house, that's for your house. God has set an open door before you that no man can shut. And then he said, I've given you the key of David that will shut what no man can open and open what no man can shut. I believe that God is putting keys in our hands today that is going to give us the victory for the future and what we need. Now, I'm going to have Apostle Tom bring this bowl because as we were getting ready to come this morning, I went, you know what? I've got keys somewhere in this house. I've got a bunch of keys. A bunch of keys. And the miracle was, I found them. My house has Christmasitis right now, okay? I can't find anything in my house. But here is a bowl of keys. And I'm going to invite you all to come up and take a key when you feel ready to. But I want to tell you something about these, these little keys. We just kind of kept them around our house. A few years ago, y'all were here on a Sunday morning and we gave you a bunch of keys. And couple years, I think it was uh, 2021, the, one of the first trips that we made back to the nations during COVID, uh, we were going to Norway. Norway was, was open, but we had to go through Amsterdam to get to Norway, and, and Amsterdam was closed. However, according to the Delta site and according to the airport site, you could actually transit Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam uh, even if you weren't vaccinated because we chose not to get vaccinated. And this was going to be a problem for most nations, but for Norway, it was no problem. But for Amsterdam, it was a problem. But we did all the research and it said, no problem, you can transit through. The night before, I had a dream. And in the dream, the Lord handed me a key and said, this is a key that you're going to use to open the doors of the nations. And in my dream, I took the key. So in the morning at some ungodly hour, like four o'clock in the morning when we woke up to get on our flight, I went and I found a couple of keys and just stuck them in my pocket. So we get to the airport in Panama City and they say this, they said, um, okay, well, we've got you checked in and everything. Where's your vaccine card? We need a copy of your vaccine card. We said, well, we're, we don't have a vaccine card. And they said, well, we can't let you on the flight then. It says that you can't fly this flight into Amsterdam without a vaccine card. We went back and forth. We showed them on the website. We showed them on the airport site. It said, sorry, but the computer's locking you out. But we have, we know the people in Panama City Airport. Uh, we know them well. <laughs> We're through there all the time. We know them well. Actually, one, one uh, morning, not too long before that, their computer system was completely shut down. They couldn't check people in. And, um, and uh, the lines were going out the door and the flights were all going to be late. And I just kind of walked up to the front and I said, hey, what's going on? And they said, our computers aren't working and we can't seem to get them to reboot. I laid hands on the computer and I said, in Jesus name, I command these computers to work. And they immediately came on and they all went, whoa. So then I went upstairs and they said, tell her to pray for the computers upstairs. Tell them to pray for the computers. So, so they know us. Okay. And so I was talking to the, we were talking to the lady and she said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll let you, we'll, we'll just let you get on the plane. And then in Atlanta, if they don't like it, they can send you back. In other words, we don't want this to be our problem. We don't want to tell you no. How we think favor is people not telling you no. So we got to the airport in Atlanta. We went up to the gate 
And we explained the situation uh, because we didn't have a vaccine card in the system. And they said, well, sorry, you can't fly. They had just denied the girl in front of us because her vaccines weren't up to date and told her she couldn't fly. And so we get up there, we don't even have a vaccine card and they go back and forth. And so finally, uh, the, the, the manager comes out and she said, well, you know what? They let her on the plane, they let him on the plane in Panama City. They've got a boarding pass. We can let them on the plane here. But she said, they're probably going to send you back. And we said, she said, so it's up to you. We said, no, we'll, we'll go ahead and get on the plane. So we get on the plane, we board, we get in our regular seats and everything. And right before the doors were getting ready to close, here comes the manager on the plane. And she says, Mr. Miss Hammond, get your stuff. And so we gather up our stuff and we're following her. She goes, yeah, we've upgraded you to first class. <laughs> So we flew to Amsterdam, we're standing in line, they're pulling people out of line because either their vaccine cards aren't up to date or they don't have a vaccine card or whatever, but they're pulling people out, people are crying, people are upset, we're watching all of this. And I, I reached into my pocket and I hand Pastor Tom the key and I said, let's just believe God. God said he was gonna give us a key that would open the doors to nations. And so, when, so we did that, we each put a key in our hand and we just kinda just were praying in the spirit as we walked up there. And when we got up there, um, the guy said, you know, give me your passports, took his passports. He's going to come get him a key, huh? He wants a key of David. There you go, right there. Y'all can come get a key if you want one, okay? Right when we get up to the, to the, de to the gate, uh, to, to the passport office, the guy looks at us and he says, where are you going? And we slid across our passports without any vaccine cards. He goes, where are you going? And we said, well, we're going to Norway. And he goes, Norway, man, I love Norway. Norway's gonna be beautiful this time of year. You guys are gonna have so much fun. And he stamps our passports, slides them back to us and let us go through. How many think God knows what we need and he's giving us keys this year that are going to open things up to us that are going to give us an ability to prosper where it looks impossible, to have access where it looks impossible. I just believe that in this season of time, God is saying that we've got to, we've got to elevate our faith. And so as you're coming to get these keys, Apostle Tom, come, I want you to pray over these people. We're going to release the key of David, the key of authority the key of fa favor, the key of blessing, the key of anointing. If you've already gotten your key lifted up, if you're getting that, just have faith. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we decree that you have spoken the word even to the church of Philadelphia where you have given us the key of David. And that means there are things that cannot open because of man, but they will open because of your command. And Father, there are things that need to be shut behind us and we decree that the enemy cannot open it up either. And so Father, we decree favor, we decree increase. We decree the blessing. We decree a key that will begin to work powerfully for us in this year and that you have things in mind for this season that we need to understand. You've already decreed the victory. You've already decreed the open door and that you've given us what we need to be able to accomplish the vision of heaven and the blessings of your word. Father, we decree this is a representation of the spiritual dimension of the key of David. And so we're not at the uh, the behest of man. We're not at the whims of man. We're at the blessing of your hand. What you have said over us is what's going to work. It's what's going to happen. It's what's going to be released. No man can stop it. No man can put his hand to it and say no. We, and you have decreed yes. And so we declare yes and that we are blessed and that you're going to bring us through the door into the more of all that God has decreed over our lives in Jesus. And we have a couple more. Somebody's bringing one or two back. A couple more. All right, great. Listen, if we don't have enough, we'll bring some more next week. All right, if you're a part of this house, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. So I, I want you to just raise your expectation level for the things that are coming in this next season of time. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit out of uh, Psalms 24 because I believe that this is a, a passage that will guide us this year in experiencing victory 
over chaos. Amen. And this is the scripture that says, open the gates to the king of glory. And what we have to understand about this particular scripture is that this scripture was written when David recovered the ark and was bringing it into Jerusalem. Now, let me kind of give you the history a little bit. Um, 20 years before, over almost 21 years before, the Philistines came in and raided Israel at Shiloh and took the Ark of God's Covenant captive. The Ark was the place where it was a, it was a box that had cherubim on the top, and it had... Um, it had Moses' tablets in it. It had manna from the wilderness, and it had Aaron's rod. But what it became was a, a place of God's glory, a place of God's presence and God's power. And when the Philistines took it, because they thought if it's giving power to the Israelites, it'll give power to us. But instead, what happened is that they broke out in boils and hemorrhoids. There's a curse for you. Selah. And so they sent it back to Israel after seven months. They moved it around to a bunch of different cities. They sent it back. And they ended up putting it into the house of Abinadab, which was one of Saul's sons, and it stayed there for 20 years. It never says anything about it blessing Abinadab, never says anything about that, but it stayed there for 20 years. When David became king, one of the first things he decided to do was to bring the ark back to Jerusalem and to establish the tabernacle of David. How many understand God doesn't say, I'm going to restore the tabernacle of Moses? He says, I'm going to restore the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. 24-7 worship, 24-7 prayer, a place where God was glorified around the clock in, in the lives of, of the people. And God said, I'm going to restore that. I'm going to rebuild that. So this really is a psalm that speaks about recovery, about restoration, about celebration, and about God's power. So the first thing that I want to say as a key um, in, in victory over chaos is that we got to understand that one of the things about chaos is that chaos is personified throughout the scripture. Okay, when the enemy robs from you, that's chaos. When the enemy is doing evil work, that is chaos. It's not just when people are rallying and, and crying out in the streets. It's any time the enemy is perpetrating evil, that is chaos. And so the first thing that we see, that we need to understand is that chaos is also um, personified as a dragon in Psalms chapter 51, the chaos dragon. It was a personification of, I think that there's a, there, there's a screen for this, that there was a personification of Egypt and Babylon and all the enemies of Israel uh, that were uh, arrayed against them. And so David basically is saying, I am bringing God's government, I am bringing God's order, I am beginning to overthrow the works of chaos and the works of corruption and the works of confusion, and I'm beginning to bring my life and my light down into the earth. So the very first thing that we're going to see in Psalms chapter 24, and I'm going to read it to you, is that he starts out by saying, the earth is the Lord's and in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he's founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those that seek him who seek your face. So the first thing I want to say about this in overthrowing chaos is that it is a time that we individually, as well as corporately, need to understand the importance of ascending to the mountain of the Lord. That this is going to be a year to soar in 2024 because we are ascending the mountain of the Lord. Now, he starts out by saying, the earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. He's founded it on the waters because what he is saying is, in the beginning, God said, it says that the earth was without form and void. That phrase, without form, means it was full of chaos. It was full of chaos and confusion. And into chaos and confusion, God spoke 
and establish the foundation of the earth. How many understand whatever chaos you feel like has come against you or your family or your finances or your life, God has an ability and he is still speaking order into chaos. Just lift your hands if you need some order in your chaos, all right? So he's founded it upon the water, but he said you can't just come any old way. He says you got to come with clean hands. What are clean hands? That's right actions. That's how we treat one another. That's how do we faithfully serve God in our assignment. We got to come with clean hands. We got to come with a pure heart. That's our attitudes, our intentions, our motives, uh, what we set our heart on, our affections. We can't serve idols. Oh, you say, well, we don't serve idols. Well, if there's anything that's standing in the way of you passionately pursuing God, that's an idol. Okay, God's going to be ruthless with our idols this year. He's going to be ruthless with our sacred cows. All right? So just be prepared for that. When God says, I'm bringing order, we go, yay. But he goes, no, no, no. That means I got to root up, tear down, throw down, destroy so that I can build and plant. Okay? And then he says, and who have not sworn deceitfully. So we've got to let God put a coal to our lips this year. Amen? So I want us to stand to our feet, and we're going to come into agreement with ascending to the mountain of the Lord by making a decree. We're going to make a decree to ascend. And while you're standing up, I will say this. The mountain of the Lord is the place of, of prayer, a place of personal worship, a place of drawing close to God. If this is the only time you're worshiping, you're missing it. If this is the only time you're hearing the word, then you're malnourished. You're starving to death. Okay? We need to be doing this every single day. And I have a place a number of years ago that I started dreaming about. It was a, in my dream, we were off on some adventure, and we turned off on this road, and it was a, it was a winding, narrow road, but it climbed up this mountain, all the way to the top of this mountain. And from the mountaintop, it was the most beautiful place on the earth the most beautiful. You could see for miles. You could experience the presence of God. It was the most beautiful mountain. And since that time, in my dreams, every now and then we'll be in the middle of a whole nother dream and we'll turn off on that road and go up to the mountain. How many know that in the middle of your life, in the middle of your activity, God may turn you to go up to the mountain? Every single day, Jesus went up to the mountain to commune with the Father, okay? And so we need to to put that as a priority in our life this year to go up to the mountain of the Lord. But as I was praying into this new year, um, I, I had a dream about the mountain. And in this dream, we were organizing a whole group of people to go up to the mountain because I wanted to show everybody how amazing the mountain of the Lord was. And we were getting everybody organized and people were getting distracted and this was happening, that was happening. And we lost the daylight and we couldn't go to the mountain. Listen, guys, we got to be sure that we're not distracted or that we get too busy and that we're not going to the mountain of the Lord. Can we reprioritize that here at the beginning of the year? Don't just go through reading your Bible, saying a couple little sentences of prayer. Let's find a place of really communing with God. Let's say this together. This is a decree to ascend. Say it, read it with me. I acknowledge and decree that you are the God that triumphs over chaos. You speak into nothing and you create something. You turn the void into a place of life and light. I commit my life to you again this year, Lord. Give me clean hands and a pure heart. I repent of every wrong action and attitude. I refuse to allow anything to become an idol or stand in the way of my personal revival and pursuit of you. Let my lips speak the freedom of truth. I will give myself to prayer the study of your word, and dwell in your presence. I will ascend to the mountain of the Lord in 2024 and will soar with you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise, amen? All right, you can be seated. Number two, it is also, number two, out of Psalms 24, a time for commanded blessing. God says if you do this, he said, he shall receive the blessing of the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. 
So David's setting things in right order as he's bringing the ark up in to Jerusalem. Now, I mentioned to you that it was in the house of Abinadab for 20 years. When David became king, he decided, I'm going to go get the ark and bring it to Jerusalem. So they made a cart um, uh, and, and had a couple of guys, you know, taking this cart with oxen to load the, the ark onto it. And at one point, the, the cart faltered and the ark started to fall and a man named Uzzah stuck out his hand to, to, to hold it and he got struck dead. It, it had to do with a Levitical order about not touching only who could touch the ark of the Lord. And so he took the ark and he quickly moved it into the house of a man that they found was devout, um, whose name was Obedidim. Say Obedidim. Obedidim, Obedidim, Obedidim. It's a fun one to say. And he went back and he studied how, how can we bring the cart up to Jerusalem the right way. But while the ark was in Obedidim's house, he was blessed and his whole household was blessed. If you go to that next screen, we'll see that it says, uh, when we value the presence and power of God, God commands blessing on us and our house. When we were in prayer this morning, Pastor Greg didn't know I was going to be talking about this, but he said, you know, it's time for us to all go anoint our houses again. Take some oil. doesn't have to be fancy oil. It can be cooking oil. can be olive oil. can be any kind of oil. There's nothing magical about the kind of oil. It's a point of contact. And go and anoint your house. Go and anoint your property. Anoint the boundaries. Kick out anything that shouldn't be there. Let God show you if you've got something in your house that needs to go. You know, let's, let's consecrate our houses. Let's consecrate our lives. While the ark was in the house of Obedidim, he loved the presence of God. It transformed him. And it says, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obedidim, the Gittite, three months. I want you to notice he's a Gittite. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And the Lord blessed Obedidim and all his household. Now it was told King David saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obedidim and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought the ark of God from the house of Obedidim to the city of David with gladness. I want you to notice something. Obedidim's worship caused God's response. Sometimes we're just expecting God to bless us, but we're not worshiping. Come on. He loved the presence of God. As a matter of fact, he loved the presence so much that when the ark left, Obedidim followed the ark and he followed it up to Jerusalem and he became a gatekeeper in the tabernacle of David. Now here's the amazing thing about that is that Obedidim was a Gittite. You know what a Gittite is? They were residents of the city of Gath. You know what Gath was? Gath was a Philistine city. Obedidim was a Philistine. And yet, he so loved the presence of God. He so loved the anointing of the Spirit that he, that he followed the ark up to Jerusalem and he ended up getting grafted in to the lineage of those that took care of the ark. The Levites. The most exclusive tribe in Israel, Obedidim became a gatekeeper, became a gatekeeper. Not only that, under the temple of Solomon, Obedidim's children were gatekeepers. Obedidim loved the presence of God and it caused him to be grafted in to the blessings of God, but also to the continual presence of God because he did not want to live his life without the presence of God. How many times do we just go through the day, go through the week, go through the month, and no presence? Listen, he was like, I am not going to live my life now that I've tasted the presence, now that I've tasted the goodness of God, now that I've tasted of who he is, I'm gonna, I'll give up everything I need to go after him. And God caused a generational blessing to come to him because of that. Listen, if we're not getting breakthroughs, if we're not getting our prayers answered, maybe we need to look at how are we worshiping? 
How are we prioritizing him? How are we pursuing? I'm not trying to get us into a works mentality because how many understand none of us can come to the, to the mountain of the Lord except by the blood of Jesus who cleanses us from all sin. But God is looking for something in us. He's looking for a people that are passionate about revival. We can talk about revival, but here's where revival starts. And if you've ever loved Jesus at another time in your life more than you love him right now and more than you desire to be with him right now, you need revival. When my kids were younger, teenagers, I came home from work one day and I walked in the house. I said, hey kids, they went, hey mom. But we had a little dog back then. Her name was Baby. Ugly little white dog. Only a mother could love. But Baby loved it when I came home. So Baby came running up to me and she used to dance on her hind legs. She would dance and I would say, hello Baby, it's so good to see you. And I'd scratch her and she would roll over and she, we would have this moment. And one day the kids go, Mom. You walk in the house, you go, hey kids. Then you go, hello baby, baby, baby. I said, well, if you greeted me the way the baby greeted me, maybe you'd get a different response. And so the next day, I came home. I said, hey, kids. They went, mom, mom, mom. And they ran up to me, and they hugged me, and they made over me. And I went, hello, it's so good to see you all. How many understand sometimes when we're not getting the response from God that we want, maybe we need to change our position? Now, let me show you a difference. Obedidim so loved God, and he ended up with a generational blessing. But when David brought the ark back into Jerusalem, his first wife, Michael, who was the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and despised David. She despised his exuberant worship. She, she, she shamed him. She tried to deride him for dancing with all his might before the Lord. Listen, I get it. Some people don't understand all that goes on here. We stand on the platform and we watch some people that are first timers and they're like, what in the world is this? But you know what David said? David said, I'm going to be even more undignified than this. <laughs> Pastor Dean wrote a song a lot of years ago called His Glory's Coming Back to the City. That's what this is about. His glory is coming back to the city. His glory is coming back to our life. His glory is coming back to our nation. Come on, God is on the move. He's overthrowing chaos. But listen, when Michael despised him, it says she was barren the rest of her life. So we can pursue God and be blessed, or we can despise what God is doing and be barren. That's, that's not a hard choice to make, is it? I want us to stand to our feet. Let's make a decree. Let's lift up our hands and decree this together. Like Obadidim, I will welcome the presence and power of God into my heart and my home. I will passionately pursue Jesus and receive the commanded blessing of the Lord. Because of my love for God, this will be a year of blessing and recovery for me of all that has been stolen by the enemy. I receive double for my trouble in finances, health, opportunity, joy, peace and vision by the power of God's word and Christ's sacrifice. My home will honor God and be blessed. My family will experience revival and be blessed. My generations will fulfill their destiny in Christ. I will walk in peace and have victory over chaos. This will be a year to restore in 2024. In Jesus' name, I decree it. If you believe that, I want you to give a shout to the Lord. Amen? You can be seated. Next part of this is the very famous passage out of Psalms 24. And it's the time to welcome the king of glory, the Lord Sabaoth. It's a year, listen, of spiritual war in 2024. It says, lift up your heads, O you gates, 
and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? Lift up your hands all over this place. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. The Lord of hosts, the Lord Sabaoth. David wasn't just asking for a city gate to be lifted. He was saying, I want you to open your heart to the king of glory. To who the king of glory? To the, to the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts. Listen, the Lord of hosts is mentioned 284 times in the Old Testament. It is the most used reference to who God is. Jehovah Sabaoth, he is the, he's the guy that we saw in Joshua chapter 5 as the commander of the Lord's army before they crossed into Jericho. He was, in Exodus 14, the God that fights for us, that he said. In, Je in Exodus chapter 15, our God is a mighty man of war. Now listen, I know that there's lots of names in the scripture. There's Jehovah Shalom, God our peace. Jehovah Rapha, God our healer. There's Jehovah um, Sidkenu, God our righteousness. There is uh, Jehovah Jireh, our provider. There's all these amazing names of God. Not many gods, but many names, many attributes of who God is. I believe this year we're going to need God to show up as Jehovah Sabaoth. The God that fights for us. David extolled the Lord of hosts when he went out to fight Goliath. October 6th, everything changed in the earth. We're in a season of war. I don't know if you paid attention, but North Korea is firing missiles at South Korea. South Korea is firing missiles back. October the 6th, I was preaching here on the first Friday of October. And for weeks, I kept feeling like the last night of the Feast of Tabernacles, the, the last night of Sukkot. I actually contacted our friend Rabbi and said, what is that, what's the significance of that night? It was October the 6th. What's the significance of it? And he, he kind of downloaded some things that I preached about then. And I really felt as I prayed about it, I felt like it was gonna be a turning point in the earth. October the 6th, the end of Sukkot. And I preached that night about the Cyrus anointing. Isaiah chapter 45, Cyrus was the guy that released the children out of Babylonian, the Israeli children out of Babylonian captivity. Isaiah 45, I can't preach, I can't even hardly begin to quote it because then I want to preach it, okay? But that's where it talks about the double doors. And the Lord said the people need a Cyrus anointing. And in that chapter, it says in Isaiah 45, it says, I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places. The phrase treasures of darkness does not mean treasure chest hidden in a cave. What that phrase in Hebrew means is I will give you armories of weapons and hidden riches of secret places. So God's going to give us weapons and he's going to give us wealth. Weapons and wealth. Now, I'm not talking about natural weapons, okay, for some of you gun enthusiasts, okay, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about spiritual weapons. And I felt like the Lord said this. I felt like God said, the people need to understand that we're in a season right now where God is upgrading our spiritual weaponry. Same weapons, prayer, praise, prophecy, a, a lot of the things that we've taught about in the past, but God's saying, I'm taking it to an upgraded place because you cannot fight a modern war with World War II weapons. And you cannot fight the battles that we're facing in this season without upgraded spiritual weapons for this season and this time. So God is going to give us different strategies, different insight. He's going to give us different ways to, 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 to express it. Listen, I know that Jesus already won the victory, but how many understand he left us on the earth to enforce it? People that say, oh, there's no such thing as spiritual warfare because Jesus already won the victory. Well, then why is there still a devil running around taking people captive and stealing, killing, and destroying? I'm telling you, we still have a work to do to enforce the victory that Jesus has purchased for us. And God wants to give us upgraded spiritual weapons. 
The Lord said to me that our battle, he said this to me on October the 6th, he said, your battle is going to be against the dragon and the prince of Persia. The dragon of chaos, the prince of Persia. Persia's symbol is a dragon. I think that there's a, a stirring up of the dragon empires in the earth. Uh, Iran and Babylon were both dragon empires. The Babylonian gates had dragons all over the gates. The Iranian uh, empire had a lot of dragons in their symbolism. China, of course, North Korea, all of these are dragon nations. I think that there's a lot of things that are stirring right now. As a matter of fact, there is a tinderbox. Hot spots all over the nations, all over the world. But let me say this. I do not believe that it is time or God's will for World War III. I don't believe that. I feel like God's looking at his church saying, what are you going to do? And are you going to call on me? Are you going to call on me, Jehovah Sabaoth, to begin to rise and fight for you? Now let me just say, Ukraine's at war. Russia's at war. Israel's at war. There's tension all over the world. It's not like there's not war going on and people and lives being lost. But God is saying to the church in America, we need to wake up. We need to wake up or what's over there is coming here. And I believe that we've got to be as uh, more alert than we've ever been before. We've got to have, ask God for discernment. We've got to ask God to order our steps. We're not going to live in fear, guys. I, there's no fear in this message. I'm just saying that things are stirred on a global level and that it's a season of war. That's why we need Jehovah Sabaoth to rise up on our behalf. Amen. We're going to pray prayers differently. We're going to see God differently. We're going to see him show up in different ways. Let me give you one example that you guys have heard before. And this honestly comes from about 20 years ago, but it's just such a great example of how God takes a weapon that he's given us, um, like prayer. Um, James 5 says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It, it, in another translation, it says, the earnest, heartfelt, continuous prayer of a righteous man is, um, is, um, hmm. Effectual is effectual. It's dynamic in its power. It's dynamic in its power. That's the word dunamis. George Patton, the general in World War II, and yes, I'm going to give you a George Patton quote. It's clean. It's one of the only ones we can find that's clean. But this is what George Patton said. He said, those who pray do more for this world than those who fight. And if this world goes from bad to worse... It's because there are more battles than there are prayers. If that doesn't challenge you, I don't know what does, amen? We got to rise up and allow him to show up. 20 years ago, we had on, on Highway 98 going into, uh, I think it was Destin or Fort Walton, there was a, a psychic um, palm reader's business right on Highway 98. And we had been praying and praying about all the occult that was in this area. And... Um, Sharon Stone was here, and she was still one of the elders in this church, and now she's leading over in, in Europe. But um, she stopped at the traffic light right in front of this palm reader's place of business. And she started to pray the way that we all probably had prayed. Uh, Lord, I bind the spirit of the occult. Lord, I bind the spirit of witchcraft. How many know that's good? Okay, it's good to be proactive. It's good to do those things. Lord, I bind, I bind that from operating. And the Lord stopped her and said, no, 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 don't pray that way. Instead, pray that the source of money that's keeping her in business dries up. How many know this is a different way to pray? And so she did. She just real quickly said that. She was still, sitting, still there at the traffic light. And she said, Lord, I just prayed the source of her money dries up and she'll have to go out of business. And as soon as she said those words, the front door on that business flew open a woman with this robe and a turban on her head jumped out onto the front porch and went, no! Sharon said, hmm, I think we're on to something. How many are willing to listen to the Lord and to say, God, as we come up to your mountain, we're going to hear your voice in a new way? Moses heard the voice of God on the mountain of God, and God gave him strategy. Amen? And so I want us to stand up, and we're going to make one more decree together. We're going to lift up our hands. I want you to just pray in the spirit for just a minute. Let's read together. 
I open the gate of my heart to the King of glory. I receive every part of your purpose and plan for my life and choose your ways over my ways. Let your glory saturate every part of my life as I serve you. I decree Jehovah Sabaoth is rising on my behalf. He is the Lord of the angel armies and he is fighting for me, my family, my finances, and my physical health. I receive my upgraded spiritual weapons and stand in the triumph Christ won over death and will wage war with God's prophetic word. I align my heart with heaven and will experience victory over chaos through the power of Jesus' name. And if you believe that, I want you to say amen and amen. All right, if you could be seated, I'm going to do this last part in just about three minutes, and then we've got two more minutes after that. So about another five minutes. We'll have you out of here by 1215. Three minutes, then two minutes, then maybe one more minute, then no. <laughs> How many give me five more minutes? Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. Okay. All right. This is a bonus point, okay? As I was praying about this year, we've been praying for a really good friend of ours. We minister at their church up in New Jersey. Um, if you see me preaching on reels um, for a place called King of Kings, it's their church. Okay, Bishop Hammond prophesied to Pastor Peter in the summer, said premature death's not going to take you out. Your heart, your, your heart's not going to fail you. Your brain's not going to fail you. Um, beginning of December, they had a meeting where um, a prophet was there with them and said, um, God's breaking the spirit of premature death off of your life. The Monday after that Saturday prophecy, he collapsed, stopped breathing, no heartbeat, no pulse, nothing. Uh, they started doing CPR on him until the paramedics got there. And his wife started warring with the word. How many understand your prophecies are not just to tickle your ear. They're not just to sit on your shelf. They're not just to occasionally listen to on your phone. We're going to have to really put the word of the Lord in our mouth during this year and wage war by the prophecies. Um, now we are maybe a full month later. And they didn't give him a very, very low percentage of survival, okay? Um, each day, it was something new that they thought was going to kill him, okay? But I'll tell you something. He is alive. He's breathing on his own. He's sitting up in a chair, but he's not conscious. He's not conscious. He has brain activity. Doctors say he's not brain dead. After all of that, he's not brain dead. He's alive, but he's asleep, isn't that interesting? Could be like the church. Alive but asleep. Survived but asleep. And one day when I was praying for him, I had a vision. And I saw Peter. You know, we're, we're three-part being, right? Body, soul, and spirit. His body couldn't respond. His mind, his will, his emotions can't respond. But his spirit man is alive and well. And I saw him in this vision, his spirit man, with a sword in his hand, and he was fighting this dragon. And the Lord had been speaking to me about the dragon of chaos, but this was a dragon of chaos and death. And he was fighting this dragon, and then he would go, and he would hide behind a rock and catch his breath, and then go out and fight again, fight again, fight again. Every time the doctors would say, this is going to kill him, he'd fight again. He, he'd hear it. He'd fight again. Okay? And, and when... I heard the Lord, when I, I saw that vision, I, the Lord gave me a word for him, but the Lord also gave me a word for us. And so I want you to stand and just lift up your hands for a moment, and I want to read this word over you. Because the Lord said to me that this is going to be a year of the rise of the dragon slayers. And that it is going to be a year to roar. The Lord gave me the scripture, Isaiah 42, verse 13, that says, the Lord shall go out forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up his zeal like a man of war. He shall cry out, yes, shout aloud. He shall prevail against his enemies. And I heard the Lord say there's a company of dragon slayers arising today. These are those who have looked death right in the eye and not given up, backed off, or been intimidated. These dragon slayers will operate with supernatural courage to confront chaos and confusion and every emissary of death operating in the earth. Jesus, the ultimate dragon slayer, defeated death, 
hell and the grave, paving the way for this new generation of dragon slayers who will enforce his victory. Those who thought they would be broken by the harsh trials of the last season, yet held on to the word of the Lord, that sword, they will prevail. I am waking up my people, reminding them of my prophetic promises and calling them to wage war by knowing my voice shatters the enemy. So rise up, dragon slayers. Shake off the defeat of the last season and rise into a new authority and victory for this is a new day and you shall have victory over chaos, says the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a shout. While you're still on your feet, I borrowed this, this movie clip from our dear friend Lou Engel. And he had a series of dreams where they were battling against a dragon-like spirit. And he played this, this clip. And I just thought it was appropriate since the Lord said there's the rise of the dragon slayer. This is a, a clip from Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. I'm sorry if that offends some of you. Take a deep breath. <laughs> I want you to see... Where are my dragon slayers? Where are God's dragon slayers? Come on. Authority over Python. Authority over Leviathan. Authority over chaos. Authority over death. Lift your hands up. Father, I decree right now, God, this is going to be a whole different year for us. And the God of the angel armies is rising up on our behalf, Lord. We decree courage, boldness. We decree a fresh mantle for the new day. God, we're going to passionately pursue you. We're going to experience your blessing. We're going to see the Lord Sabaoth rise on our behalf. We're going to see angels dispatched to help us. And God, we're going to see the enemy defeated on every hand. In Jesus' mighty name, give the Lord one more shout of praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, we're going to dismiss you today. We're going to have teams down front for prayer. If you'd like prayer, ministry, prophetic, healing, deliverance, whatever it is that you need, the teams down here will be happy to pray for you. God bless you guys. We love you. Happy, happy.